guys the whole way through because we just don't do it like normal people. <laughs> Hi, Gary. Do we not? That's very we interesting. Don't. I like the we, use of the royal we. There's only a royal we. You know, there's never a peasant we. No, you never hear yeah. like, you know, all we fellow peasants, you know, it's always royal we. Maybe if you're like, we, the peasants are super pissed off. You keep pushing buttons when you hired us peasants to do it. <laughs> you're not a peasant. You're a conciliary. You're That's even fair, better. Fair. You know, it's my mom's birthday today too. Happy birthday, Diane Brogan. That's so exciting. Is she here today or is she like doing something else? Well, like dad said he had to jump through hoops. So maybe my mom's swimming. Maybe she's in the channel or something like that. I did remember. say that. Well, it's nice for him to come. We have a doctor on the show today. There's a doctor in the house. Dr. Embriet Hyde. And we have Marsha Collier, eBay expert, author of, I want to say 47 books. We'll get confirmation on that later. All the books. Makes All you look like books. a slacker. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was like pretty happy that I re-released one whole book. So, all uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 going to be a different show than yesterday. Yesterday, we had YouTube stars. Today, we have a poop doctor and an e-commerce wizard. You tell her that. She's a reason. She's Every time sure. that study, I know she's a researcher him. and a writer. So a big and part of that is studying is analyzing poop, but it's not all there is. Not just the gut biome too. There's all the biomes. There's many there's, biomes. That's right. And we're going to talk about at least two biomes today. That will be two more biomes than we've ever discussed on the show before. So completely true. <laughs> all right. Lay it out. Poop doctor. Hi, Embry at Hyde. How are you? Hi, I'm great. How are you guys doing? Great scientist and researcher, Embriette Hyde. Thank you for joining us. Now, you knew you wanted to get your PhD when you were in elementary school, is that right? Well, yeah, in a way. So um, the, I was a very confused child um, when it came to yawns. Uh, I, w I noticed, as any astute child would, that yawns seemed to be contagious. And so one day I finally said, well, the only way that I know in my eight-year-old mind to solve this dilemma of why yawns are contagious is to get my PhD. That's what all the smart people do. So that's the solution. And I marched up to my mother and I said, mom, when I grow up, I'm going to get my PhD and find out why yawns are contagious. So did you find out? Uh, yes, but I didn't need a PhD for that. <laughs> you need a Google? No. Uh, yeah, there's, there is research now that suggests um, why yawns are contagious and, and why they no, I yawn, you yawn, we all yawn. Now I need the answer, Embriette. I don't think I can continue until I get it. Oh, uh, well, see, it has something to do with pathways in your brain, and there's some adaptation response that essentially if one person yawns, the body believes that it should also yawn to be on the same. I don't remember all the details. Like peer pressure? Yeah, it's like brain peer pressure. Something but it's like a it, it's a mimicry uh, neuron type response kind of a thing, isn't it? That's what yeah. I seem to recall. Yeah, there, we have neurons that when we see someone yawn, they yawn. That's why the Sullivan nod works in retail. When Embriette says, "I think I'll have a vodka tonic," and I go, "Oh, like a Tito's," <laughs> you know, and that nod works. <laughs> yeah, and now a fun fact about dogs: I learned that yawning for them is actually a way to um, make sure that everything is okay in the world. So if your dog is stressed out, yawn at it, and if it yawns back, he's telling you, "Oh, I got gotcha. you. Okay, I know I can relax." And if your dog yawns at you, he's probably stressed out. So if you yawn back, then he'll calm down. Weird. I've tried it. Sugar wow, nodding now. <laughs> Does anybody <laughs> yawning? I hope not during our show. That would be depressing. Everybody's yawning. It's great. That doesn't work as well. Uh, uh, so you you uh, aptly corrected me that you're not just sitting around with, you know, I don't know, poop in a jar and looking at it and shaking it and stuff. You actually write and do science. And what we were talking about was the fact that what you do is it's pretty important, which is such a dumb sentence. What you do is very important. Otherwise, why would we have you on the show? But scientists come up with what they come up with. And then they almost always have to partner with someone to put that into a document of some kind and research materials and all that. What you're saying is it's a pretty dangerous world right now because of the way that's being done. Can you talk just a minute about that? Yeah, I actually think the current situation with COVID is a really good example of it, of this issue, but the issue has been around forever. And the problem is that um, scientists, when we get our training, we're not taught how to talk about science in like English <laughs> or to people who speak English. We're just taught to talk about science with other scientists. And so there's jargon, 
And there's all these little nuances that everybody who does science understands, but we really do a disservice to the general public when we do that and to ourselves because the funding for science, much of it comes from the government. A lot of government policy is dictated by the votes um, of you and me and everybody else. And so if we give people um, unrealistic expectations about science, then they begin not to trust us and the voting changes, we lose funding, and it's just this horrible spiral. Um, people also can like just get really crazy information from places based on preliminary studies um, that some journalist or editor decided would be a great idea to have like a clickbait type title, but no truth or substance in it. And they can really hurt themselves, make themselves sick or just do something really dumb. Um, and it's a big problem. So that's one of the issues that I was trying to tackle when I decided to dedicate most of my time to writing about science instead of doing, do I mean like Facebook science? Yes, that's one <laughs> very good example. <laughs> Well, that's um, what I was going to say is, you know, some of the world knows about places like PubMed, and I imagine mm -hmm. that there's other kind of search platforms like that for some of the science you do, uh, as well as PubMed. Uh, but it, it, there's a whole lot of Facebook scientists out there now. Yeah. And even PubMed isn't the greatest um, resource because uh, that's where you find all of the peer reviewed papers. And so okay. they're very sciencey. And um, even me as a PhD researcher who is trained how to read scientific papers, if it's outside of my expertise area, sometimes even I have a hard time understanding what in the world these people are talking about. And so to expect, you know, somebody from the general public to go in there and read it and be like, well, now all my science questions are answered is unrealistic. Um, but there are a lot of good publications out there that do a great job of um, condensing it down and making it readable by other people while also being responsible about the reporting. I just saw you tweet, though, that sometimes peer review scientists aren't doing their jobs, that they actually succumb to pressure when the scientists will be like, I don't like that you didn't like my thing. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. There are a lot of issues with the peer review process as well, and you could probably have a whole separate show on that. Like, that's not how that's supposed to work. <laughs> We're no. relying on them to kick it back and say this isn't good enough. And now they're like, well, okay, to put it like so that. So when, when people say in their argument, when you look at the science, what they kind of mean is when you read, you know, the Mother Jones article, which is an abstract of the abstract of the science. Is that accurate to say? And you mentioned, well, PubMed's not that great because, you know, people can go into PubMed and they can abstract it in whatever way they want and say, see, I told you sugar was good to eat. Uh, <laughs> so w w how do you help people understand that? And happy birthday, Diane Brogan, who just showed up. Yeah, you know, there's some resources out there, but essentially what we really need to be doing is teaching people the red flags and sort of things to look out for when they're reading anything, whether it's actually a scientific article or whether it's a journal, journalistic um, popular media article about a scientific article. And this kind of harkens back to the, the peer review issue, but one of the most powerful things you can do is just look and see where the funding comes from. Um, you know, if it's an article about the benefits of stevia as opposed to other artificial sweeteners and then come to find out it's funded by one of the biggest stevia producers, you might want to be a little skeptical of that. Um, you know, did they doctor their data? Animal studies are also very powerful tools for science, but one of the issues that we fall into a lot is drawing conclusions too quickly and extrapolating to humans based on results that we have found in animals. And while we're closely related, the biology is different in many important ways. And that's actually the reason why most drugs fail in clinical trials. It's not that scientists are just picking random drug um, targets out of thin air and testing them to find the one that works. The reason they're testing them is because they actually worked in an animal model. And so they think it's a good option now to test in humans and the vast majority of the time they fail. And so it really hurts my soul when I see people reading an article and writing an article about a scientific article where it was an animal model, even if the results were exciting. What often happens is the excitement is heightened to a level where people now think that they can go and apply this to their own lives and have the same results. And, you know, best case scenario, nothing happens, but now they don't trust science worst case scenario, they actually make themselves sick or hurt themselves. And 
we definitely don't want that in any situation. In the, uh, so I'm going to bring it back to poop doctor because I have to. The, <laughs> of course. So in, there's like, for instance, I had read and I forget where that there's a process that if you want to kind of do a quick instant, like gut biomectomy, you could basically eat someone's super healthy gut biome poop. And suddenly your gut biome will sort of, you know, pick that up and say that's you're supposed delicious. to eat it. Or are you supposed to like pack it in there? <laughs> I don't know. We're going to find that out, but let me, let me ask okay. this question. So I started neither, with, neither option sounds good. By the way, I started with, you know, eat some really healthy poop and you're going to feel better. But Let's pretend that's what I think I, I saw. What do you do to tell the average uh, Steve or Diane Rogan, like, here's how you go and refute that information or find out if you think that's even accurate? Like, what's what's your, like, process to say, let's see if that's what really was said? One of the things that um, I really like to bring up to people is, despite the fact that we are almost 100% identical genetically, you can look at people and tell that they're different. Now, our genes, like our human genes, are outnumbered by the bacterial genes in our body, 360 to 1. And we can be more different microbially than we are genetically from one another. So it could be true that a person who is healthy, their microbiome works for them. That doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Uh, some th there, there are types of bacteria that are called opportunistic pathogens. What this means is that under normal situation, they don't hurt anybody, but if put into the right person, or should I say the wrong person, they could do great harm. And you would never take a blood transfusion without testing the blood. But what people who are jumping on, is actually called a fecal transplant. <laughs> so, and it's exactly so pack it in, not eat it. <laughs> So Just people who are jumping on the fecal transplant bandwagon are forgetting that and they're throwing all caution to the wind. Um, and my question would be, why would you want to do a fecal transplant without testing it and knowing exactly what's in there? If you wouldn't do that with a blood test for very good reason, you don't want to get HIV, you don't want to get hepatitis or some of these other bloodborne pathogens. So it's the same thing. And the other thing is um, we have to look at what situations this has been tested under. Fecal transplant is actually very, very effective for people with an infection called C. diff um, or Clostridium difficile. And we know why that works because we've done the science to understand it. But just because it helps in that one situation doesn't mean it's going to help in every situation because all diseases are different. Their causes are different. Even different people get different symptoms because biologically we're just different from each other. And so those are usually the things that I try to remind people of. Mostly it's just common sense. Like you don't even have to get into the science of it. Just ask them a question. Well, would you get a blood transfusion without testing? No. Okay. Why would you do that with this? Um, but then if they want it and they're open to it, you can go a little bit more into the science of things and just, you know, it's, it works here and this is why we understand it, but different diseases are different and there's no saying whether it would work in those other situations. And if right. you're not doing it under a highly controlled, you know, situation, you could do real harm. Actually. But don't try uh, this at home is what you're saying. Yeah. I sound so morbid. My favorite, like, I don't, I don't mean this is my favorite example because like it's awesome and I like it, but it's goes to exactly what I'm talking about. There was somebody who gave themselves a fecal transplant to try to heal um, some gut issues they were having. And they actually gave themselves C. diff. <laughs> Oh um, no. And it's like, ah, you people just, just don't know that's a really bad thing. You don't want it. It goes around nursing yeah. homes and other, you know, environments like that. And you really don't want yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and you know, the person that that individual got the fecal transplant from didn't know that they carried this organism in their body because they were healthy and their immune system was okay. And so there were no symptoms. And you know, if you look at me, I look healthy. You would, you know maybe feel comfortable taking a poop transplant. But from still you, no but thank you though. I'm going to RSVP no to that. Well, there, well, is the, there is the ick factor. And a lot of um, researchers are now trying to figure out how to do this in, in pill form, kind of like a probiotic. Like, is there just a minimum number of species that will do it so that you don't have to take the whole poop and, um, and do it that way. Back up. I feel like we didn't even talk about why somebody would do that. Like why somebody would consider Oh, because it transfers, is, at least ostensibly, it transfers the good stuff in that person's gut biome 
instantly into your gut biome. Yes, it's like but a, why do we care about what's in your gut biome? Oh, oh well, that's the next question. What makes, it, <laughs> what makes the gut biome important? Yeah, we're like way down the poop transplant road. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, friend. <laughs> why are we, we even put, having this conversation? We put the cart way before the horse. Um, yeah, uh, humans, like we don't live in isolation, right? And there are microbes that we can't see that live in and on us. And they're not just along for the ride. I mean, some of them are. Um, but what has happened is that we have this focus on germs and this belief that all microbes are bad. But what the science is bringing us back to, and our ancestors kind of already knew this, they just didn't understand scientifically why, um, is that most microbes are either harmful or actually good for us. And so beans, beans, the musical fruit, the more you eat, the more you toot. That happens because of microbes. And so our cells actually can't break down insoluble fibers that we intake with fibrous foods, such as vegetables and beans and so on and so forth. Turns out that that's actually a really great food source for them. And they just break it down, they metabolize it. They do their own bacterial version of poop. Um, something called short chain fatty acids that result from this breakdown of fiber. This is like and poop inception, poopception. Yeah, poop and so we're actually way more full of shit than you thought. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, we're, but, a lot of us are in marketing here in Bria. Yeah. So, I don't know. Um, but these short chain fatty acids actually uh, are really important for keeping our intestinal cells healthy. And so if we, it, it's like, you feed yourself, you feed your microbes, or you feed your microbes, you feed yourself. There are certain vitamins that our human cells cannot produce that are produced by microbes in their metabolic actions and for the occasional bad guy that comes in. Um, and this is why the, the fecal transplant, this is what Chris was getting at, um, they actually fight off the bad ones because it's kind of like territory wars. They don't see it coming in and think, Oh my God, a bad bacteria is going to kill my human host. If I don't kick them out, they just think oh, a bacteria is coming in, try to steal my food. I'm going to kick them out. And then it just happens to work great for us. Um, so what does it do for your overall health? Yeah, it's really important for overall health. Um, the thing is, we're still trying to figure out exactly why and how, but a lot of these, you know, grandma um, recommendations that we've been given throughout the years now are starting to make sense why they work as we add the microbiome as a factor. Um, but I want to be careful to highlight that it's not just the microbiome. The microbiome is part of the system. And we're like a huge bag of physiology that has a lot of different things that come into play, but it all affects everything else. And so, for example, a lot of people are surprised to find this out. I knew I was, but serotonin, which is awesome. Don't say, <laughs> Kate, that's funny. Um, <laughs> Wait, hold on. I heard to put this whole big thing up for Carol. And then she's going to cover you for a second. This is a Canadian version of the Bean song. That's how we Thanks. said it in Maine. Thanks for saying that. I like by. the Canadian version. <laughs> but, um, oh, where was I? I totally got uh, sidetracked. Marsha Collier backstage was wondering, can't we just eat yogurt? <laughs> she said a private oh, chat. That's a really good question. Um, and so here's the thing. When it comes to the microbiome, it's actually really hard to identify what a healthy microbiome is versus a microbiome of a sick person. Because what seems to happen is when we get sick, microbes disappear. And so you lose diversity and people become more similar on that spectrum. Whereas if you're healthy and you have a very diverse microbiome, um, they can look very different from one another. And so the yogurt thing is plagued by essentially FDA um, rules and regulations, poop yogurt gross. And that's kind of like chocolate mousse, I guess. Um, <laughs> But what happens is there are some probiotic species that have been very well tested and very well studied in the context of disease. So there are certain probiotics that we know help with irritable bowel syndrome and that we know help with diarrhea that can be, that can happen after you take antibiotics. But as a way to maintain health, it's really hard to assess even without understanding what health means. And the issue with probiotic species is that they have an FDA status that's called GRAS. It stands for Generally Recognized as Safe. 
So anybody who wants to can mix and match a whole bunch of these things together, create a yogurt or some other type of probiotic and sell it without having to do any scientific studies to show that it does anything at all. It might do something, it might not, but as long as there are no claims made on the label, then you can sell it and make money off of it, which is why there's so many out there. And um, the other issue is whether or not it's even alive when you eat it. So I had some colleagues um, up at Stanford, which is you know just a little ways north of where I am currently located. And they went to Trader Joe's and collected, I think it was like 12 of the most popular yogurt and yogurt type um, products out there. And they actually just put them on plates to try to grow bacteria and only three of them grew. So in most of the yogurt, they were dead anyway. Um, and dead organisms don't do anything. <laughs> so you're essentially just eating. I, someone just wrote it. Don't they have a lot of sugar? They do. Um, and so you're almost like uh, mitigate, like getting rid of any potential benefit by adding in all the sugar as well. Um, so you have to be really careful with, with what's out there in terms of probiotics. I eat yogurt because it tastes good. And I eat Greek yogurt. It has a lot of protein. But I always get the plain. I make sure there's no sugar added. We saw and, you it right before we went on air. Yeah, I was going to say, we saw yeah, that live. That's right. Um, yes, that's a true story, right. folks. <laughs> so right. um, I just want to pass <laughs> out that we have, uh, you can get a whole lot more of Dr. Embry at Hyde. And you have to understand that when fools like us talk to her, we're, we're like, you know, this is like 0.0001% of like the entirety of what she can do in her brain. So you got to go to Dr. Hyde, not Jekyll, to get the full thing. If you can hang out, Embry, at, please do. Uh, and if you can't, then get the hell up. Very nice to talk to you. Hey, be um, nice to her. I am. She's helping nice. you with your gut microbiome. My biome feels thirty times better already, <laughs> just um, from the talk. Good talk. Yeah, good talk, Belly. You know, and I have so much. I have thirty times more gut right now, so my health is great. So we're switching in in our very ninety degree segue fashion uh, to the incredible e commerce and otherwise you know insanely prolific author and absolute star of stage and screen marcia collier how are you fine how are you that was all so fascinating I, i'm just so glad that i can still eat greek yogurt i mean i was just worried there oh yeah right you're waiting for that shoe to drop <laughs> right I, I i've always thought i'm doing a good thing god god well, thank goodness thank you <laughs> live and learn live it's and learn. amazing how it no, works out marcia is it 47 books or is you it know honestly now? i I lost count because like, there's I don't translations know. in there and, and there's stuff. But who would figure I wrote uh, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for seniors is now on its third edition and people are actually buying it. And, and that was just like a one-off book. I just wanted to the first one just right. And Chris, your parents reviewed it. Happy birthday, Diane. Um, they reviewed it. It's a fun book. And that just became the side of it. But when the thing that I really do, hi, Deb. Hi, everybody. Uh, the thing that I really do is I love taking scientific or technology white papers and translating it just like I do with my For Dummies books, but not for dummies, for real people. And I love translating technology. I'm only a surreal person, so I can't vouch for that because I get a lot out of dummies books. But the uh, the thought I have all the time is that when you write these books, I mean, dummies books can do so much for somebody, but they also require a super strict format to write. So that's kind of tricky. I wanted you to talk to that just a minute because people, when they look at them, they, they, they think one thing, I think, when they're not sort of on the inside, but you've written a bunch at this point. So talk just a minute about the dummies format, if you would. Yeah, I mean, the dummies format is really amazing. It's uh, You must insert a tip here. Let people know more about the subject right here. Use a bulleted list. Uh, and if you don't use these things, you get it back from an editor saying, hey, you got to do this. And so the format of the books, it's kind of like having someone on your shoulder reminding you what you need to do. And I like that because it keeps me in line because otherwise I can go on some crazy tangents and have. I think I did a full chapter on the Kelvin of light bulbs. And that came back saying, no, no, nobody cares but you. <laughs> but I did the Kelvin of light bulbs. It's fascinating the different colors you get from a light bulb. 
But um, I thought you know, the titles could be shorter. So Facebook and Twitter <laughs> for senior citizens for dummies. I was like, why no not just dumb senior citizens? Yeah, for dumb because seniors. We're not, because we're not dumb. People aren't dumb. People just don't want to Well, series for is help. for dummies, Marsha. By definition, people buying it are dummies. Well, I am. aren't we all? Aren't yeah, we all? <laughs> I mean, I'm really? Save space on the cover. That's valuable real estate. I, I mean, if I would get a book from your last guest for dummies, you know, poop for dummies, I'd be grateful because I'm totally a dummy <laughs> when it comes to poop. You, know, you look and you go, hmm, poop. Okay. Like poop. So I think, but I think like she was pointing out, like Embriette was saying, it's not necessarily our fault that we're dummies because like mainstream media takes her very well thought out peer reviewed scientific article and turns it into some clickbaity Buzzfeed headline. You know, one of my, one of my hobbies is skincare. So I'm always reading all the articles and I'm reading longevity things are happening with earthworms. Really? Earthworms? You know, I am not going to live long enough for this to translate from earthworms to people so you just move along at the internet is full of so much misinformation and one of my goals is to go ahead and rewrite a lot of these things and translate them so they make sense and you know we we were going to talk about your backpack you know and i was thinking about things about backpack for the not the apocalypse quite yet but the pandemic <laughs> Although it does seem a little bit like the apocalypse, doesn't it? Right, it actually seems a know? lot like the apocalypse, actually. <laughs> right? How often, it, don't you, earthworms in skincare? Yeah, you know, who knew? They, they have these little skins. But, I mean, how much have you guys left the house? As little minimally? as I humanly can. Yeah, minimally. Right? Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I am dying to get outside. So, and they said, well, you could pick up from a restaurant. I don't want to pick up from a restaurant. I want to sit at a table with a white tablecloth. And I want it nice if I'm paying that kind of money. I mean, because, you know, you get the email saying, oh, come to our place. And then we get the other emails from total strangers you follow on Twitter saying, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I know you will benefit from it. Really? Really? You know who I am? Because I probably won't give a damn about your thing. At least, I just this is something I want to tell everybody. If you're going to DM somebody that just followed you, say hello. Or say hello in open Twitter. Don't send them, subscribe to my, I have a newsletter. I have a this. I have a that. Don't start selling right away. It's just so rude. My personal favorite is, can I be on your podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you just get that one yesterday? Yesterday. Crazy. Wait, but yep. that's. That's so sad because I do. I have a podcast also, which I've had for like forever. Um, and it's it's pretty successful. And it's on technology, which has nothing to do with eBay or social media or business. It's totally on another planet, which is what I love because I can be on technology. But people are always saying, can I be on your podcast? So what do you do in technology? Oh, I run a big business and I'm, I can do this and I, I could teach everybody. That's not what the, have you even listened? You know, Pat, I think that should be your answer, Carrie. When people want to be on your podcast, just say, have you listened? What do you think you could have to contribute? You know, and my answer them... is unsubscribe. Let me connect you with DIS. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hold on one sec. <laughs> right well, that's interesting. Deb points out the fact that you're brutally honest on your podcast, which is, it's a very different experience from everyone kind of throwing softballs back and forth. You know, Embriette was talking about the fact that, you know, the most money in science goes to the, the sexier or the most politically appealing things. Same is true in tech, right? If you say loving things, you'll get more guests. If you poop on somebody, <laughs> if you poop on somebody, you get uh, less of that. But, you know, I think that, you know, then you lose your trust. I want to thank Deb because I don't get a lot of validation. You know, on a podcast, unless you have an audience like you guys have, you don't really know what people are thinking, but you know when people are downloading it. And I am brutally honest because there's so much bullshit out. Oh, could I say that? Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Oh, okay, there's so I much mean, it's bullshit out now. Doctor said it shit <laughs> on, on technology. Do you know there is more written in technology in press releases saying about what comes is coming out soon? Oh, Apple's going to have this new thing with three cameras, and it's really. And then the, then it comes out, and it's kind of it, it's a phone. It's just a phone. So you hear all these tech writers, and I also do a bit on. Uh, one of the KFI Nerdorama podcasts. 
And what I do there is I speak honestly and I hear the other reporters that are during the day are played on the air and you know, they're doing the press release thing. And I'm, I'm going, you can't do that to people. I want to give people as Chris wants to give people and Carrie to things that you're interested in for gosh sake. Right? Like, what are you going to do this afternoon, Chris? Uh, gee, that's a good question. Uh, I think I have a, I have a tech demo oddly enough. So I'm watching some, <laughs> some video tech demo about a guy who came up with sort of a, a mechanical Turkish version of, um, making video for big corporations. Now, the fact that it's Turkish, does that, is that Turkish the country or Turkish as in the Turk? Well, now that I think about it, the term mechanical Turk actually points like, to the right. fact that it's okay. not really, uh, it, well, I mean, it's automated, but not in the way you think it is. And it's sliced right. with a little more human hand on it, which makes it mechanical Turk. But it's, it's oddly like, it's almost like they took the part I wouldn't expect from automation. Right. And they took the part I wouldn't expect from humans and like put the horse, you know, underneath the cart instead. Carrie, what are you doing this afternoon? Not a damn thing, Marsha. No, actually, <laughs> see, I, I, I didn't have a damn... jobs for marketing props, so I have to do I have to do grown up work later. <laughs> you got grown up. I don't have any grown up work to do oh. later, so I'm going to list stuff on eBay because there is nothing more fun than selling your good crap on eBay and having people send you money. This whole show There's, is about crap. I mean, <laughs> see, that. see, it's perfect. No, I mean, how many gifts do you have in that closet that you have been given by somebody that you don't care about? Or they're nice, but it's just not you. Just list them on eBay because talking a little trending right now in the, uh, there's, hey, I have had that on my website since like 2008 and everybody stole it from me. <laughs> there you go. That's been my tagline. But the thing is, people are bored at home. They are buying on e-commerce like crazy. E-commerce is going to friggin' explode for the holidays because there's not going to be, even if we could all go out, even if we could, there's no supply chain bringing supplies to stores. The stores aren't ordering merchandise. None of the pre, there's this thing called a merchandise calendar, which I mentioned in one of my books, whereas you plan for the seasons. None of that is happening now. So if you're in e-commerce, and let me tell you, dipping your toe in, and, and I do not work for eBay, just get this straight. I don't even think they like me much. It's the truth. So they, they don't talk to me. You have a 10th edition? Oh, that's lovely. Click. Um, they don't care. But my point is it, it's a great way for all of us to make extra money. And I know, yeah, they charge. And I know there's all this. And there's Mercari. And there's all different other places. Just do it. Just yeah. if you What's list. What's that peach on, candle doing for you in the closet? Nothing. Right? I have a whole <laughs> drawer of candles. For some reason, I went through a period of time. People gave me these Fakakta candles. I don't know what you're supposed to do with it. You start a fire in the house. I live in California. The whole place goes up in flames. I, I don't need a candle. I just walk outside. But, you know, I can, that's a good idea, Carrie. I think I'm going to sell some of those French candles on eBay. <laughs> For the there holidays. you go. It's perfect for the holidays <laughs> for those people that you don't know what they're what they like and you don't super care. Right. You get them something. Yeah. Oh, John, you sold video games on eBay, right? Right. It's exploding. He said the prices the past three months are higher than are higher than ever. Makes sense because you can't go anywhere. And do right. Anything. And everybody's kind of bored. And what's really been going on in the video game industry, just to tie that to this for a second, is that um, everybody slowed down, everybody being working from home. And there's this new kind of uh, trend in video gaming saying, don't work your engineers to death. Maybe actually, you know, allow the release date to slip a little bit, which has accidentally, somewhat unintentionally, put a huge uh, drought in new video game releases. And so there's just all kinds of people uh, looking back to what kind of classics they can play. So suddenly yeah, those games, Chris, yeah, there's going to be a new Microsoft Indeed. flight simulator and That's they say heard. it's going to integrate with Bing, Bing maps. So you can like fly over your house and <laughs> I, I like to have little 
you know, things to. I like your I like your plane. <laughs> I like that you illustrate for us in case we've forgotten in the long months since the I pandemic know, began. I be, what planes you, do? But when You're we're so going right. to be able to start traveling again, it's just really going to suck because the nice lady isn't going to say, "Would you like a drink?" She's going to say, "Sit in your chair and be sure your mask is on." And there's going to be somebody sitting next to you. I'm just hoping our pilot doesn't use Bing Maps. That's all I'm stuck yeah. on. <laughs> but anyway, the new Microsoft simulator is going to be out uh, by the end of the year. And it's going to be available. And this is not a press release thing. I've actually seen it. And it's uh, amazing. You can I actually look down from the plane and fly over your neighborhood and see your house. It's so cool. And that'll be available for the PC. So at least some people are smart enough. Well, well, look who's buying TikTok too, right? So, what do you think about that one? Not that I really ever want to cover anything like this on any show ever, but, but yeah, this is one this person is in the talking. audience is very interested in the answer. Oh well, <laughs> because she see, TikToks all the time. Well, the thing is, what we're not accepting in this world is there's a whole bunch of crap we get from China. I mean, let's just face it. I'm a fan of Huawei, and and I have done work with them, but the technology I've gotten from them has been groundbreaking. It, it's, you know, stuff that then comes later to other phones because I, I test Samsungs too, and I'll have the Samsung phone and get the update on one phone, and then six months later, I get the same feature on the Samsung phone. But Apple phones are made in China, and no doubt there's Chinese technology in there. Every camera that you've got for security is made in China. Microphones are made in China. And TikTok, for God's sake, is a Beijing company. You can't get any more Chinese than being from Beijing. I, either we have to say we're going to cut ourselves off from tech in the rest of the world, or we're going to figure out a way to do this. See, Canada, Canada can still TikTok just because... We're not even going to say how they, they're so lucky. You're the queen right. of the world, Carol. We get, to, we get to see demos of Canadian TikToks. It's uh, it's like a whole different thing. Yeah. Right. Like American TikToks, but everything on the left side. But if Microsoft. <laughs> looks different. <laughs> like but if Microsoft still buys it, that's great. Oh, wait. The, explain why the UK is waiting. You to know, rid that's to rid of Huawei. This is an interesting thing. The uh, founder of Huawei. Nice man. He's, if any of us remember, and Chris, you're old enough to remember this. Remember, there used to be a guy who built computers down the street, sure. and you could buy custom computers from him, and you'd be supporting his family and him. Well, the guy who founded this mega company, Huawei, he and his buddies sat in his apartment making networking equipment. They'd buy the parts from other people, they'd put it together, and they'd sell it. So, long story. Uh, we have to decide. He offered to sell the code to share the 5G that they have already done. They've already accomplished it. They have Africa covered with 5G, all these places, but not the U.S. And we're sitting here paddling, well, we're going to develop our own 5G. But why should we start from scratch? He offered to sell it. He offered to partner. Um, we have to decide whether we are going to be a technological world of our own, which in that case, we need to consider what we're doing with Apple and what we're doing with everybody else who's manufacturing in China and sending technology here. And buying TikTok is an excellent move because then we do have more control. And those people who don't understand in our government anything about technology will be able to understand it just a little better. By the way, it's been really fun watching uh, people in UK burn down uh, what they think are 5G towers and wiping out <laughs> two, 2 and 4G at every turn, bless their little souls. Um, you know, the, you talk about the fact of, you know, the difference between technologists and people who are kind of tech enthusiasts. It's a cell tower. It must be 5G uh, is wiping out essential services all over the UK. It's been pretty entertaining. But I can't really throw stones at people dealing with misinformation because we have a president that asked if we could inject light into our bodies. So. I'm not going to be able to throw any stones. I bet Dr. Hyde had a chance to look over that paper. Uh, so, Sasha well, we says, could, Sasha, we could do a whole show on. <laughs> you could do it on Marcia's show. Cause <laughs> that's that's what right. She, that's what she covers. Only, only my co-host doesn't like to talk about it. Oh, well, I uh -oh. can understand it. 
Marsha, the 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 Carlos way doesn't Dungeon get a lot of say, Marsha, in my experience. <laughs> no. But you see, I can uh, laugh at my co-host when I let him. I can laugh near mine. Um, <laughs> so, Marsha, one question I do have, though, you know, and going back to things like eBay, by the way, uh, I I had said to a friend of mine who is known for uh, her gardening prowess. I said, boy, we're going to go back to Victory Gardens like we had in World War II because all the good food Big was being time. sent to the troops. And all of a sudden, we're going to need to make some you know, food on our lawns instead of just pretty flowers. I think the same is true with things like eBay. 40 million people out of work. I have this feeling that maybe a few more people are going to have to dip in. I've been seeing people... Um, uh, well, how do I want to say this? I've been seeing people that I couldn't imagine being a guy talking about their eBay. I've seen a lot of them suddenly listing eBay in their Twitter stream, as well as their like business projects. And I think that we're going to see a lot more of it. What do you think? Well, I definitely do think, and, and even you talked victory gardens and that's a whole other show. Like we've got a garden out back. My husband's growing lettuce and all kinds of things that have bugs on them that I, I don't want to get near, but um, he's the brave one and he's the farmer, but you can even, you know, sell baby plants. You can find baby plants on Amazon. And as a third party seller, if you wanted to do cuttings of, of rare plants, you could be selling them. It's so easy to just, but the problem is you have to make the effort. And that's the thing, just like Chris, you doing this show with Carrie, you had to make the effort. You had to commit. You had to say, what am I going to do every day? You had to make an outline for yourself. You had to set goals. And if you don't set goals, nothing is going to happen. So that's e-commerce in a nutshell. And that's life, really. And the pandemic. Don't just sit around and watch TV all day. Set a goal, even if it's a simple goal. Going to the 7-Eleven for ice cream. Do that. That's it's a, a goal. good goal. I like Although it. Not if you ask Embry yet. <laughs> well, and I'm going to ask her, is ice cream well, off the table? <laughs> can we get ice cream, mom? Are we allowed? <laughs> Everything in moderation. Thank you. Including my it's, it's, it's really a lifestyle. You know, it's, it's different if you have ice cream every once in a while, but your diet mainly focuses on whole foods and vegetables and fruits. It's a completely another thing when you're sitting on the couch and all you eat is ice cream and Twinkies. And <laughs> I agree with Twinkies. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I get, I'm so lazy, I'm not a good cook. I get all my uh, meals from Freshly, which has organic, fresh food that's already cooked, comes once a week to the house. It's like little TV dinners every week, and they're organic and wonderful. Probably the best source. advice I've ever been given for what to eat is, could you have picked it or killed it in the last half hour? And if the answer is no, don't eat it. Right. So you mean, does that mean like you shouldn't be eating things that come from far away or something like, cause that says local to me, but I don't know if local actually matters that much. Well, that's actually a whole nother argument. And I, I do um, favor local versus not for a number of reasons. I mean, you could get into the whole environmental argument there as well. Um, but it's like, uh, are you going to eat the, um, the salad that's made with fresh arugula and cucumbers that you cut up? Or are you going to eat those, um, I don't remember what they're called, but they're like veggie sticks or something. It's essentially potato right, chips right. that oh, masquerade yeah. as vegetables right. and they're mm -hmm. supposed to be healthier. You know, like I, I can't go out and pick a veggie chip from my garden. <laughs> well, like, like I said, we grow uh, vegetables out back and we eat local honey, which I always wanted to ask, oh, for is the this allergy. a myth? Is this a myth? Chris, ask the question because you know what I'm asking. Yeah. So they say that if you're, you know, deal with plant allergies and that sort of a thing and pollen allergies, that if you eat local honey that, you know, came out of a bee's butt, um, does that make you less allergic? I don't know. Um, I honestly don't know that. That's a really a school, Embryette. That's an intriguing question. I might have to get my second PhD in that one and, and be. Okay. Will you DM me? Because I really want to. In like four years, Marsha. <laughs> Say your alarm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, because I, th I think, and impossible meat, well, you know, as much as I'd love to be a vegetarian, I don't see anything really all natural in that impossible meat or anything that I want to put into my body. Yeah, it's a good point. And um, one of the things that is kind of like the hidden dirty secret about it is that in order to get vegetable or um, lab protein, like lab made proteins to have the texture and like mouthfeel that we're used to and we all love. There's a lot of um, 
preservatives and sodium and things that go in there. And so you're almost like just for all the good that it does, you're kind of eliminating it with all of the bad crap that you put in there. So thank you. You, know. you validated Marsha. I'm just going to eat a whole thing of Ben and Jerry's by myself over the course of one weekend. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I haven't weekend, eaten enough Umbria. ice cream in years that I just haven't done it. I, I've gotten so used to yogurt and whatever else it is. I, I do eat frozen Halo Top, though. That's I've had that a couple of times. You can always make your own because then you also know what's gone into it. And, uh, you know, you yeah, don't but have then I know how many calories are in it. <laughs> yeah. And there's no artificial colorings or unless you add food coloring. It, well, if that's your gig, go ahead. But right. Um, you know, I, I take issue with um, food ingredient labels where there's like 20 ingredients for bread. I made bread the other day and there were three ingredients, water, flour, and oil. Like you don't need 20 ingredients to make bread. Um, and I've talked to several people who um, have lived in different areas of the world where they're either from a different area of the world or spent some time living there. And different food allergies and things that they have here in the States just don't exist in in those areas of the world. And, and I think it should give us pause and think about how we're producing our foods, not just the plant-based foods, but even the animal-based foods, how the animal lives, even how it's killed, all affects the quality of the meat. I actually just learned the other day that grass-fed beef has more anti-inflammatory omega-3s in it than regular beef that was, you know, grain fed and raised and who knows what kind of conditions. So this um, is brilliant. And I wanted to ask you because I believe in grain fed beef. I've also liked to eat kosher beef because yeah. there's a religious thing in that you want to explain more about that because the animals aren't afraid or something. They're treated yeah, differently. It's a very humane way of slaughtering the animals, the kosher method. Um, but one of the most intriguing scientific studies I read, and now I can't remember which one it is, but I'll have to look it up, was looking at the stress hormones and other hormones that are released at the moment of death with different methods of killing animals and how that affects the meat and what you subsequently intake. And it really is critical. It can play a big role in the uh, ability to get nutrients from the meat, but also you're eating those stress hormones. Um, so you got to sneak animal. up behind them. Yeah. Well, exactly. they do have a way of doing it. Uh, I, I don't want to know the details, but that's <laughs> why, that's why yeah. I do eat kosher meat yes. or grain fed when I can. Yeah. It's a very humane way of doing it. And I guess when I said grain fed, I was remiss. Um, I kind of Rest generalized fed. that a little bit. Not all grain fed cattle is bad. It's more, what I meant was the big agricultural cattle companies only feed grain. It's because they pack the cows in these barns. And that's really the issue. It's not the fact that they're eating grain. It's, it's just the that humanity. they can't live as cows. Right. <laughs> they can't. The cow yeah. manity is uh, not maintained. Well, that's, uh, you know, the book I popped up on screen is a uh, pal, uh, Rob Wolf's book, and it's called Sacred Cow, uh, Diana Rogers and Rob Wolf. It's the case for better meat. And it's also why well-raised meat is good for you and good for the planet. Yeah. Good. And it's definitely a book worth checking out just in so far as, you know, there's a lot of times that, you know, things like impossible meat came along. By the way, I had my first ever impossible burger and I was like, this is amazing. This tastes like, you know, the heme B thing where it feels like it's bloody like a cow, you know, and all that sort of thing. It's got but all it, those chemicals to make you taste it. <laughs> exactly. And you suddenly think afterwards, wait a minute. I like those tasty I've been chemicals. Taken. <laughs> this tastes too good to be good. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. It, it does taste different too. Like you can totally tell the difference between um, meat that has been humanely treated versus not. Oh, well, thank I, you so much. Really. Oh, yay. I think, there you go. Hello there. That's ah. a humanely treated. Uh, Look at that. Oh, <laughs> tree. <laughs> but thank Aww. you for the tip on the kosher meat because I wanted to be sure yeah. that I was doing because I'm paying extra. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> worth it. And um, I mean, there, yeah, I would say it's worth it. But as with anything, like paying extra for organic is worth it too, for sure. Oh, What's absolutely. beet blood? What's John talking about? Beet blood oh, he's out. talking about how they make oh. the, the vegetable based protein look like it's bleeding when you eat it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So when you, when you cut theater. into an impossible burger, it looks like, yeah. you know, a little bit of blood on the plate, which your, your mind wants to fill those details in. And so it's like, this must be delicious, you know, because 
It's how we were raised. I feel like we get a lot of people turning up in the hopes of an animal sighting on the show between like <laughs> between the we one should, that yes. Yeah. Between the we guests and the <laughs> uh so one question I have that sort of ties everybody together and, and we're heading towards we have like 10 minutes left of the show. Things have changed since the apocalypse or the pre-pocalypse. I like John's uh, word pre-pocalypse. Uh, things have changed. And insofar as things have changed, we, you know, reevaluate a lot. We reevaluate what we choose to do with our time, what we choose to eat, how we want to conduct ourselves, what matters. I really feel like a lot of us, and, and this this place to Marsha like, with regards to sell your dumb things, um, but also Embryat with, you know, where you want to focus your time. Yeah. What's changed for both of you, you know, since being locked away? Well, for me, it was really hard in the beginning. I mean, really hard because I was used to traveling all the time and going places and doing things. The first couple of months, I would wake up with a start. Aren't I supposed to be on a plane? And then I'd have to calm down. So seriously, I had to get through that mental set that I was at home. And then I was feeling useless because not a lot was happening. A lot of my work had to do with traveling. And I wasn't traveling. So I figured, how do I do my book unless I'm writing a book? I have no work to do. So I had to reconfigure my feelings and how I felt about my own work and my own self-worth. Sure. And it, it was a major process. I'm coming through the other side now, but it was a process. Dr. And, Hyde. In the beginning, you know, I, I kind of counted myself fortunate because life in general didn't change a whole lot for me. I work from home as it is anyway. And, um, there weren't the restrictions in the sense like I could still walk my dogs every day outside and, and do things like this, but, and I'm highly introverted. It may come as a shock, but um, I'm not an extroverted personality. I, I, I tire really quickly in social situations, but the thing that was the hardest for me that really just kind of took me off guard was not being able to work out at my gym with everyone else, just having that camaraderie. That's a and social I, thing. Yeah. Yeah. I really learned the value of, of social situations. And so when that happened, I kind of started getting very frustrated and very upset and following the same same dialogue of everyone else, like go back to normal, et cetera. And I had to go through this exercise that was probably spiritual just as much as physical and everything else of letting go of the thing. Like this situation is out of our control. It is what it is. And there's nothing we can do to, to go back to the way it was. So we can choose to either go on pause um, indefinitely, or we can choose to adapt to it and change. And so, um, you know, one of my friends said this, he's like, you know, I've noticed the people who kind of went on pause and are just waiting for it to go away so they can go back to normal. They're not adjusting well. Whereas the people who have learned to take the situation and, and adapt to it, those are the people that are doing well. And so I've been working very hard to be in that second group um, rather than the first group. Well, that's amazing. You really said it just perfectly because you just can't sit around in life and wait for something to happen yeah. in any form. Yeah. I like how Deb says the uh, hard part about changing behavior and thought is letting go. Yeah, that's um, true. You know, good thing we had oh, Anna from Frozen on earlier in the week, you know, so, or the week <laughs> before. So. We did. We had the first black woman to play Princess Anna on Broadway on the show. Fabulous. That's so Fabulous. cool. Did she sing for you? No. <laughs> no. Oh my gosh! You never let theater people sing on your dumb show. They'll never stop. It's terrible. I really? I, for me, it was more like for it. I didn't want to be like entertain us. You know, like you know. Well, I Carrie, was, I see you have a, a guitar back there. Why don't you drum a little tune and start singing? Yeah, yeah. Well, let me do that. Um, Stin's, <laughs> Stin's not doing the gym as much, Carrie. <laughs> Stin's not doing the gym as much. Carrie has been doing a lot more guitar lessons. So I have. I've know. doubled up on guitar lessons because I miss the gym too. Which I am not a person that was like, no days off, go to the gym. Blah, blah. I was like, you know, <laughs> roll into the gym for like thirty solid minutes and whatever, and and uh, do my thing. And I, it got awkward for a while. I thought about changing gyms because there were people that'd be like, oh, hey, like one woman would always be like, I love you. You look so good. And like, it was so nice. But at the same time, I'm from Boston. And I was like, I don't know about that. I don't know about uh, talking about like <laughs> If you went to the gym in California, truth, truth, right, Embryette? It's a whole different planet out here in California. We yeah. Just, and actually, know. my husband and I built a gym in our garage. And that's been a so really cool exercise because that's like how CrossFit started was 
in a garage. And now all these CrossFit athletes have been forced to return to the roots. And I love it. It's so cool. But I do return to the garage. Are you a CrossFit trainer? You level is it level one? A level one, yeah. Level one. Yeah, well, that means that you could basically wow. own the business at this point. Uh you know, <laughs> If I have to buy it. it all back, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Talk about a crazy branding experience that's been. Um, you can get I have stuff a friend on eBay. Who owns, For I have sure. a friend who owns a CrossFit <laughs> up this way, and every it's this is very similar to what happened with Bikram Yoga. Um, uh, Bikram Gandhi uh, had his issues, and uh, basically, if you were a Bikram Yoga uh, gym owner or whatever yoga studio owner, you had to decide: Am I keeping that name on my on my wall because it means something yeah. now? So every box, every CrossFit gym had to decide what they were going to do with that. And it's a, it's definitely a deal. All right. So we're at the end of the show. So one of the things we ask is a question that relates to uh, the, the topic of the show, the theory theme of the show, the backpack. And basically what goes in your backpack? Backpacks are portable. We're sort of working in this world where it's very, uh, everything's moving. We're building on sand. So five things that I've added to the backpack that'll be in my upcoming book by the same name. Story, collaboration, autonomy, Manchu, which means one family and execution, Marsha and Embriette. What is one thing that we can add to the backpack so that people can survive the next five years? Persistence. I like it. Mm. I I'll like persistence. persistence. Um, flexibility. Ooh, the two of those together are great. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take if you them. persistently I'll take them. work out, you gain flexibility. <laughs> That's for sure. I like it. <laughs> there you go. Well, it seems okay, like we Okay, now all do those. we all go in our favorite yoga pose to end the show? Oh, it's funny you should ask that. There's kind of a, a tradition around here 